All right. So related to expansion is the Hubble constant, of course. And there's a very closely related idea called the Hubble time, which I think we've touched on basically a little bit. Um, and so for Hubble's law, just to review, this is the relationship that relates the distance of a galaxy to its speed or its red redshift. And then the Hubble constant is this H. And so as a reminder, Hubble found this um, relationship by measuring the distances to distant galaxies and then also measuring their velocity by their redshift. And H, Hubble's constant, is the slope of the line that best fits this data. So you did this in the Hubble's Law Lab. Um, but it's better to um, describe the velocities as redshifts because that's what we actually measure. And also, um, if we think about the units of the Hubble Law, where this speed unit has the units of distance times time, um, this D is obviously a unit of distance. Um, then what does the unit of H have to be so that we get the right results for the units? Okay, yes, in the units that we usually use, E would be correct. But if we're just thinking about what kinds of units and not the specific unit, then we are looking at B, that the Hubble constant has to have units of one over time in order to make this relationship work out. Um, in practice, it has units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. And of course, then, since the kilometer is a unit of distance, and so is the megaparsec, if you convert one or the other of those to be common units, then they will cancel and you'll be left with one over seconds. And that's one over time. So that's essentially um, why we consider that the Hubble constant has units of one divided by time. Or I guess you could call this inverse time. So why is that interesting? Well, it gives us a specific time if we take one divided by Hubble's constant. Since Hubble's constant has units of one over time, one over Hubble constant gives you a unit of time and we call this the Hubble time. So it's a special time that's related specifically to what the expansion rate of space is. Um, so if you actually calculate one over H naught, uh, and do the unit conversion I mentioned on the previous slide, you get an age of nearly 14 billion years. It's sensitive to the exact value of the Hubble constant that you use, um, but it gives us essentially the age of the universe. So that's just saying that if, if everything is uh, expanding at a given rate, and we assume that it has always been expanding at that rate, then if we just follow things all the way back in time, then 14 billion years ago, is when things had to start expanding in order to have their current uh, distances and, and at the expansion rate we see. All right. So um, H naught is the Hubble constant right now, and T naught is the age of the universe using that particular constant. But in general, H, the Hubble constant, is not necessarily constant. And we kind of gave you a homework problem a while ago that kind of probed at that idea a little bit. And I want to explore it a little bit further in today's first activity. So you're going to examine how Hubble's constant might actually change. So um, there are various reasons that you might think of for why Hubble's constant could change over time. Um, for one thing, gravity between massive objects pulls objects together. And so this could slow down their expansion. We ran into this idea before because when we um, talked about measuring dark matter, one of the ways that we measure dark matter is by seeing how Hubble's constant appears to be different for specific galaxies as they're being pulled by massive galaxy clusters that are nearby. So they're sort of, you know, they would be expanding uh, in a way governed by Hubble's law, but instead they're a little bit slower because of the influence of a nearby cluster. So that's one particular idea that we have for how Hubble's um, constant could change over time, right? And maybe it's true that if there's a lot of gravity in the universe, then Hubble's constant would be slower, right? As we'll see, that's part of our models of universe expansion. So there's lots of different ways that we can actually measure distance in order to, uh-oh, that's not what I wanted to do. You didn't see that. I'll ask you anyway. There's lots of different distance measurements, right? 
So what are these names of our two highest rungs? And because I already showed you the answer, um, pull up the chat and tell me what is the method called of this yellow one? So in the chat, what is the name of this yellow method? You can do public or private. Yes, yes. So that's the Tully Fisher relation. Good. All right. So you remember some of the distance measurements. Um, the orange one, of course, was the method of Cepheid variable stars. Blue one is spectroscopic parallax. Green is parallax. Purple is radar. All right. So the two highest rungs are the standard candle and Hubble's law. And these are both good to fairly large distances, though, as we've already mentioned in class, Hubble's constant, because it's not totally constant in time, um, is no longer appropriate at extremely high distances. And so the, um, the activity, right, shows that directly. If you try to look at Hubble's constant or try to use Hubble's law for those far distances and you didn't take into account the acceleration, then you would actually be overestimating uh, the speed of those galaxies. All right, so there are different ways that we measure Hubble's constant and the measurements that were on the activity clustered in that um, upper right hand corner, those come from supernova observations, right? And this is a very direct method. We use their apparent magnitude that we measure and we know that type 1a supernova have fairly constant absolute magnitudes. Therefore, we use the inverse square law to get their distance. Um, and by measuring the redshift of galaxies, we can then use Hubble's law to calculate their speed and thus their distance. And um, it's worth pointing out now that this is an imperfect way to think about Hubble's law as a method for calculating distance because the cosmological redshift is not really caused by the Doppler shift. So we think about moving objects um, causing Doppler shifts. So we think about redshift as being connected to speed, but really, the expansion of space just makes wavelengths in the universe longer. It's just as if you were going to draw something on a rubber band and stretch it out. Um, it would stretch as the rubber band stretches, not because the words that you wrote got bigger, but because the space that they were written on got bigger. And so really, if you wanna think about this, um, if you, you know, connected the dots on this balloon or kind of traced out that wavelength, but then you expanded the space, well, then the wavelength gets longer and all of those objects get farther away. But not because they actually changed, only because the space changed. So my point here is that you can't really think of Hubble's law as connecting distance to speed anymore. It's kind of inappropriate to think about the speed. Um, instead, what we're doing is we're measuring the redshift directly um, as the stretching of space-time stretches out wavelengths. And that is used to give us distance based on our um, knowledge of the Hubble's constant of how fast space-time is stretching. Okay, so we're just going directly from redshift to distance is the net result of all of that. Okay, so when we do these two different um, measurements, when we try to calculate the distance to galaxies using redshift, and then we try to calculate distance using supernovae that are in those galaxies, the same galaxies, um, those distances don't agree. And this is a problem. And one of the things that physicists considered was that perhaps supernovae behaved differently in the past than they did today for some reason. Or maybe there was a lot of dust in between us and the supernova. And so we're not accounting for that properly. So they look dimmer, right? But it turned out that even considering those um, as possibilities, it still didn't um, cause those distance measurements to come into agreement. So if the light of a supernova is too dim, right? If the apparent magnitude is, is too dim, then that means that we've actually moved farther away than we actually expected based on Hubble's law since they sent their light. And so that means that the rate of expansion, the rate that we have separated has increased over time. So this is what we um, call the acceleration of expansion. All right. So if the space time that we're in is expanding and also it's accelerating, we have to explain how that's happening, right? So our first law was, you know, maybe Hubble's constant changes because of the effects of gravity. Maybe that gets stronger or weaker over time, or maybe the, um, you know, arrangement of matter 
causes that to change over time, the, the overall gravitational pull inward. Um, but maybe there's actually something else that's increasing the rate of expansion and pushing space time to expand ever faster. And so uh, this energy, we had to call it something. So we just called it dark energy. Not super creative, I guess. Um, but we, re we really don't know what dark energy is. We just know that there is something that needs to explain why space time expands. And so dark energy is essentially just a placeholder for our ignorance of what that is. All right. So we know that we have mass in the universe. We assume that we have dark energy in the universe. We include both of these in the models that we build. And so I wanna give you a question to kind of probe at the, to build some intuition for what these two different um, sources of stuff do. So what happens with more mass and what happens with more dark energy? Yeah, basically. So um, for some reason, this is to my brain doesn't immediately click. Um, but yeah, if there's more mass in the universe, then that means that the expansion has to grow at a slower rate because there's more mass to keep everything attracted together for lack of a better word. Um, and if you add dark energy, that causes the expansion to increase. And so a universe with more dark energy with a given amount of mass will grow faster. All right, so that's why the answer is B. More mass means that the expansion will slow. More dark energy means the expansion will be faster. And we'll talk in, well, I guess next time about some of the ways that matter and energy kind of came to be in the early universe and how their density has changed over time.